Hi, and welcome to the Business Career College video series, where we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about business owners and financial planning. Uh, this, set of, this set of videos is being recorded in the summer of 2018. Uh, to the best efforts available, everything in these videos uh, will be current as of that date. Uh, we are going to delve into some tax and legal issues, and it is recommended that if you are seeking advice for your own circumstance, that you deal with the appropriate tax and professional advisors. Nothing in these videos is intended as tax advice or legal advice. Uh, this is intended as general information. Um, so who's presenting this? Well, uh, I am Jason Watt. I'll talk more about myself in a moment. I'm one of the instructors and owners at Business Career College. Um, you will find us online at www.businesscareercollege.com and we are providers of a variety of courses, all in the financial services arena. Uh, we take care of a lot of people's life insurance licensing needs and the related needs there. Uh, we take care of all the components to get somebody from start to finish with their uh, pursuit of the certified financial planner designation. We do a fair bit of work in the continuing education area. Um, we also take care of, and this is what this course is partly based on, the, um, we take care of students who are pursuing the Chartered Life Underwriter designation, which is in, in Canada anyways, an advocacy-owned designation. And uh, we do help some students out with coursework along the way there. Um, and a few other odds and ends, Elder Planning Counselor, which is a course that uh, people often take when they are dealing with clients who are aging or in retirement. Um, so lots of stuff, really uh, pretty broad spectrum of stuff to help those in the financial services sector. And of course, I'd love it if people uh, saw these videos and called us looking for help, although the uh, intention is not at all that these videos are um, advertising for Business Career College, but rather that they're able, that they're there for people working in the industry to be able to brush up on uh, concepts that tie into all of um, these areas. Uh, so I am Jason Watt. I'm a full-time financial services instructor. been doing this for a little more than 12 years now, and I've helped students through most of the programs that we offer. Um, most of my time today is spent around the uh, Certified Financial Planner designation. Uh, prior to doing this, I was in the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, I live in Edmonton, married with uh, three great kids and two grandchildren. Uh, our rough schedule, and this is going to change a little bit, I suspect, as we work through this, will comprise about 42 videos. I do figure that as I work through this, there will be people who come back with questions and ask us to adjust the schedule or um, add in a topic, or there may be topics where um, I end up sandwiching two topics together. But I'm suspecting here that we will end up with about 40 videos. Um, those videos will be around five to 12 minutes each, covering one or two topics per video. We'll cover business planning, tax, and succession topics. And there is a case study we're going to be using to get through this. We have our three founders you'll see here, Alan, Bruce, and Connie. And we'll get to know Alan, Bruce, and Connie more in the subsequent set of videos. We also have their spouses, just for the sake of ease, Alan, Bruce, and Connie are each married, married to people outside the business. So Alan married to Amanda, Bruce married to Bonnie, and Connie married to Chuck. And then uh, from time to time, they will deal with James, their advisor as well. I hope that you uh, find the whole video series useful. I hope that you're able to follow along. I hope the case study helps. And if you have questions, uh, certainly use the comments on YouTube to address those. If you are working with part of an organized group, uh, for example, this video series was instigated by um, Jim Sullivan out of uh, the Atlantic region for investors group. Um, and if you have questions, certainly you can address those to Jim and Jim will get them back to me. I would like to specifically take a moment to uh, thank Jim for giving us the impetus 
to uh, do up this video series this way, I think it's a, a good idea to do a, uh, a sort of contained series of videos covering a particular topic. And uh, yeah, my first time trying a case study like this in a, uh, a YouTube video series. So hopefully it uh, does help people to follow along. Thank you very much and enjoy your studies. Hi, and welcome back to our series covering financial planning for business owners. This is the second video in our series. And in this video, we're going to look at the basics of corporations. What is a corporation? Well, corporations actually have a fairly long history. We can go back about 800 years, and either in the late 1100s or early 1200s, see in England the first corporations. Now, those first corporations weren't what we probably are thinking about right now. Uh, the City of London, for example, which was formed in 1215, was a corporation, but it was really formed to create a governance structure for the City of London. It didn't have any share capital or anybody that took dividends or anything like that. We have to fast forward about 400 years to 1602. And in 1602, we find the Dutch East, Indi Co Dutch East India Company, VOC, formed the Dutch East India Company, which Canadians will have a good um, analogy for. The Hudson's Bay Company is a very similar corporation that arises later on. The the Dutch government of the day wanted to set up trade routes and forts and so forth in, East in, in the East Indies, and they didn't want to use their own money to do that. So they went and uh, created a, a stock market where they sold shares in the Dutch East Indies Company, or Dutch East India Company, sorry. And those shares then created capital that allowed that company to buy ships and pay sailors and so forth to create these trade routes at one time and actually still historically the Dutch East India Company was the largest company inflation adjusted ever to exist uh, by valuation so quite interesting it did end up uh, failing but it sort of failed over a long period of time and really failed sometime around the early 1800s depending on how you look at it uh, so what is a corporation today? Well, we see this uh, this evolution. We go from companies like Dutch East India Company and the Hudson's Bay Company, and we evolve to the point where we don't have governments that necessarily stay directly involved with the formation of corporations. It's still a process that you have to register your corporation. You would still go to a, a registry's office or deal with a corporate lawyer to register today, but you're no longer creating a corporation that is really an arm of the government or an extension of the government. Today, it really is an entrepreneurial activity and you have the opportunity to incorporate with relative ease. Some of the folks I'm sure watching this recording are incorporated. So what is the corporation then? Well, it's a separate tax and legal entity. Now, I think we tend to focus on the tax side of the corporation a little bit and I don't think that's necessarily the right focus. In my opinion, for what it's worth, it should be the legal structure that we should be primarily focused on. Uh, certainly the changes that we've seen through the latter part of 2017 and early 2018, I think help to emphasize that when we rely on the tax benefits of a corporation without considering the, excuse me, the legal benefits, that we can encounter some challenges. So the corporation then, from the legal perspective, it's a legal person that can own property, it can sue and be sued, and it can enter into contracts. When our shareholders invest money into the corporation, that's our capital investment into the corporation. That gives them some rights that we will see in our, uh, not next video, but the video following. And it provides a degree of liability protection, which we'll explore a little bit more in a few minutes here for those who are involved in the business. It's also a separate tax entity, as you well know. It has its own tax rates, which are usually lower than personal tax rates. That's not universally true. We will explore that a little bit. It uses any year end. 
This can be valuable from a timing perspective because you can have a different year end for your corporation than for your person. Your person would have a December 31st year end unless they die or declare bankruptcy or become a non-resident in that year, but those are pretty extreme steps to take just to get a different year end. Uh, a big tax advantage of corporations that's not often explored is that they can carry forward their tax losses. They do have, or for later use, sorry, they have more complicated both tax and legal filings. You can probably count on somewhere in the neighborhood of two to $5,000 a year to keep a corporation alive, as it were, to do both your legal and tax filings. And you can leave earnings in the corporation, creating a sort of tax deferral. Now, we see four different types of corporations here. We are almost exclusively in this course dealing with for-profit or business corporations. And these are corporations where there's a profit motive. The shareholders ultimately would have the right to take dividends here. In our other three types of corporations, there's not so much that profit motive. We have nonprofit corporations and a lot of associations would be nonprofits. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to do good works or whatever, although a lot of nonprofits do, but rather it means they don't exist for a profit motive, they exist to provide some benefit to their stakeholders or constituents. A lot of associations then are nonprofit corps. Charities exist for charitable purposes. They're notable because they have a distinct status with the Canada Revenue Agency. They're going to carry out charitable activity and they're going to be able to issue receipts associated with that charitable activity. And a relatively new type of corporation is the B Corporation. This is something that's come out of the United States and it looks like we'll have these in at least a couple of Canadian provinces, possibly by the time this video series is completed. And this is a benefit corporation. It's a for-profit corporation, but it has a social motive. And there are some specific hoops you have to jump through to demonstrate that you have this uh, social motive in addition to being for-profit. Okay, we have three folks here who decide to go into business together. Uh, they're going to incorporate a business in Nova Scotia. I'll get away from the uh, Ontario-centric nature and sometimes Alberta-centric. I'm in Alberta, so we get away from the Alberta and uh, Ontario-centric nature of these presentations and we can deal with Nova Scotia. So we've got Alan, Bruce, and Connie, and each of them brings something to this business. They're going to go into the waste management business together. So Alan has a garbage truck already, which we'll deal with more in the third video. We're actually gonna spend a fair bit of time talking about Alan's garbage truck in our third video. Uh, we have Bruce with some sales experience and Bruce knows a lot of people in the business community. Connie uh, just graduated, she's got her MBA and she's got a specialization in environmental entrepreneurship. The three of them decide that they could actually build a real business. They sit down together, they do some business planning, Maybe they hire a coach, they do a fair bit of uh, consultative work, they might go and explore possible relationships with customers, all the things that you might do when you're starting a business. The structure of our business then might look something like this. You'll see that I have sort of five groups of entities laid out here. We have our shareholders, we have our directors, we have the corporation itself, we have our managers and officers, and we have our staff. And it's important to make this distinction. Now the reality is in the early days of a corporation, our shareholders and directors and managers and officers and staff are probably all the same people. We probably only start to make a distinction here as we grow the business. In the early days then, it's probably the case that Alan, Bruce, and Connie are shareholders, directors, managers, and staff. They probably do all three roles. So shareholders, shareholders are investors in the corporation. They're the people who own the shares of the corporation. They have very little liability for the most part. If a corporation goes broke and money is owed to the Canada Revenue Agency for unpaid uh, payroll withholding taxes or unpaid uh, Canada Pension Plan or EI remittances or unpaid GST remittances, those can 
generate a personal liability for the shareholders. If the company goes broken, there's money owed to employees, and this varies quite a bit from province to province. There can be liability for the shareholders as well. Generally, the most likely source of liability for shareholders is that it's very common for shareholders who are borrowing money to start their business or to get their business running for them to offer personal guarantees, which would expose their personal assets to a claim by their creditors. The directors of the corporation, which again is probably Alan, Bruce, and Connie, they're going to have a fiduciary duty to the corporation. They are responsible for the day-to-day -day affairs of the corporation. Um, again, they can be liable for those same trust accounts with CRA if they chose not to maintain their, uh, let's say, accounts in good standing with CRA. And there's a lot of gray area here, but they may be liable for criminal activities of the corporation. The managers and officers, they are the employees of the corporation, and they typically have responsibility for a certain area of business operations. Your chief financial officer, for example, would be responsible for preparing financial statements that would be presented to the CEO and then ultimately to the board of directors, who would then pass it on to the shareholders. And the staff, again, probably Alan, Bruce, and Connie in the early days, they're going to carry out the work of the business and they're generally protected by the legal concept of vicarious liability, which says if you're doing the job you're supposed to be doing and you end up uh, committing something that might uh, cause liability for you, that that liability generally passes to the corporation, not to the employee. So that's our sort of introduction to the corporation. I hope that's useful. In the next video, we're going to talk about uh, Alan's garbage truck a little bit. We're going to look at depreciation, capital cost allowance, and undepreciated capital cost. And I hope you do join me then on our journey as we take Alan, Bruce, and Connie through their uh, corporate uh, growth and whatever follows that. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to our video series. In this video, we're going to have a look at a review of depreciation. This is the third video in our series. And while depreciation is not something that's uh, specifically covered, we need this concept in order to look at setting up our corporation. It's a fairly fundamental concept. And we'll just spend a few minutes on it. Um, as with any of our other videos, this is not intended as tax or legal advice depreciation is in practice a fairly complicated concept. If you really have a depreciation issue, uh, I would strongly urge you to get advice from a qualified tax professional, ideally a CPA. Now that being said, we can cover some, uh, some general thoughts around depreciation. So you may recall from our second video that we're dealing with Alan and Alan owns a garbage truck that he's bringing into our business. Now we're going to deal more in a later video with bringing the garbage truck into the business, but we do need to understand what happens when there is a disposition of a depreciable asset. So first off, we're going to see that we have some uh, specific concepts at work here. So he owns this garbage truck. He acquired it for $110,000. Now the garbage truck is what we would consider a piece of capital property. Uh, specifically, it's a depreciable asset. Not all capital property is depreciable. Uh, for example, intangible property for the most part, things like shares in a business, would not be depreciable. So shares or mutual fund units, these would not be depreciable. But other assets that, uh, another class rate that cannot be depreciated also would be uh, personal use property. also non-depreciable 
things like your house or the car you use only for personal use are not depreciable. Now you start to muddy those waters a little bit and many of the listeners for this video or the watchers for this video will be in this situation where you'll have a car that you use sometimes for business use and sometimes for personal use. And in that case, you'll depreciate the car only to the extent that you use the car for business use. It is actually possible, I said non-tangible assets, there are uh, intangible assets that are depreciable, things like goodwill and customer lists, and we're going to deal with these more later on, much later on in this video series. These things are depreciable, brands as well, intellectual property, patents, are all intangible property that are depreciable. These are sort of the intangibles that can provide value for a business. Okay, but we have a simpler scenario here because Alan's garbage truck is clearly tangible property. And of course you would not own a garbage truck for any other reason than using it for a business. So when Alan acquired the truck, the amount he acquired it for, just like we would expect with any other capital property, we would call that our ACB or adjusted cost base. And in the exceptionally unlikely event that Alan ever sold a garbage truck, this garbage truck for more than $110,000, there would be a capital gain. I think we can safely say that that is not likely, especially because it looks like it's been a long time since he acquired this thing. He bought it for 110,000, it's now worth 50,000. This is what we would call the fair market value or FMV. And that's the price that the uh, garbage truck would fetch if it were sold on the market today where neither the buyer nor the seller is in a panic to buy or sell. The idea being that you sort of have two people who meet on equal footing to buy or sell that asset. Now it's been depreciated down to $40,000. This is what we would call from a tax perspective, the UCC, the undepreciated capital cost. And I know that sounds like a fancy accounting term. It actually is just a little bit of a grammar test here. Basically, um, Alan has depreciated all but $40,000 of the value of this garbage truck. He has depreciated it from $110,000 down to $40,000 or he's taken $70,000 of depreciation. There's $40,000 that has not yet been depreciated. That's his UCC or undepreciated capital cost. I find a lot of times people just focus on the acronyms and then it becomes very confusing. I would suggest that you're really better off to focus on the language. The language does tell you what it is undepreciated, it's not yet depreciated, and then capital, the amount he spent to buy it, and the cost, the cost he spent to buy it. So that's really actually pretty straightforward if you approach it from the perspective of what the whole word means. Now, what would happen here if he were to sell it today or otherwise dispose of it? Well, because it would be, he would have proceeds presumably of $50,000 and there's a UCC of $40,000, we would simply take the proceeds minus the UCC and we would have then a recapture of depreciation of $10,000. Basically, the Income Tax Act says, Okay, Alan, you said this thing was worth only $40,000, but you were able to sell it for $50,000. When you depreciated it, you were able to generate tax benefits. So every time he depreciated this truck, he took a little bit of tax benefit. There's $70,000 there, 110 minus $40,000 of depreciation. That was deductible. against income, okay? So he had uh, whatever amount of income, but over the years, he was able to reduce his taxable income by that $70,000 of depreciation. And now, because he's able to sell it for 
Now, keep in mind, he is really making money at this. He's going to have $50,000 in his pocket. But on that $50,000 sale, uh, 10000 of it creates a recapture of depreciation that's taxable as income. It basically just undoes the tax deduction that he previously took. And it's not a capital gain or anything like that. It's just $10,000 added to income. Okay, now what if the market value was now $45,000 and he has depreciated it only to $55,000? This is a little bit of a different scenario, a little bit more complicated. But what happens here is basically he's missed out on $10,000 of depreciation. And because he's missed out on it, he would take that now. And that means he's going to have what we call a terminal loss of $10,000. And that's deductible, just like his depreciation would have been. Now, if the garbage truck were not the last uh, piece of property in its class, let's say he owned a whole fleet of garbage trucks, then this becomes quite a bit more complicated. If there's a fleet of garbage trucks, then you don't have recapture of depreciation or terminal losses. Instead, what would be a recapture would now just uh, reduce the UCC for the fleet. Basically meaning there's $10,000 less depreciation that can be taken. Or instead of a terminal loss, there would be an increase in the fleet's UCC, basically increasing the amount of depreciation that could be taken for that fleet. I hope that uh, makes sense in terms of Alan and his garbage truck. We're going to look at one more uh, similar scenario here, or one more scenario, not specifically to do with Alan, but at least so that we can get a little bit more of a handle on depreciation. We're actually going to walk through a depreciation example here, a very, very elementary depreciation example. In this instance, uh, not related at all to our case study, we have a business that acquires uh, land and building together. They pay, this business pays $1.8 million for this. Now the land, land as with shares and other assets, other, um, sorry, as it was shares and mutual fund units, this is not a depreciable asset. Whereas the building, it is depreciable. So when you acquire land and building like this, you have to carve up which portion fits in which category. A building happens to depreciate at a rate of 4%. You don't have to carry around rates of depreciation. They're very easy to Google. Um, some common rates of depreciation, passenger vehicles, for the most part, depreciate at a rate of 30%. There are some exceptions, but uh, the passenger vehicles that you would use as a financial advisor will normally depreciate at a rate of 3, 30%, sorry, 30%. Uh, computers and software generally depreciate at a rate of 50%, 50%. A lot of equipment depreciates at a rate of 8%, and uh, buildings depreciate at a rate of 4%, as do leasehold improvements to buildings. So we have the building worth uh, $700,000. And we're going to apply a 4% rate of depreciation to this building. Now, there is a rule called the first year rule, which says in the first year that a property is acquired, 
you only get to use half your depreciation. And the whole idea here is that it is supposed to save us from having to figure out, oh, did you buy it three days into the year or 180 days into the year or 355 days into the year? Instead, this just gets to be an averaging effect that really just wipes out any kind of concerns around timing issues. So you have $14,000 then, $700,000 times 4% will be $28,000, but half of that would be $14,000 of capital cost allowance, CCA, or depreciation. And that basically means that we can depreciate this building by up to, by $14,000 that year. Now, just a quick note on planning here. Um, we know already that corporations can carry forward their losses. So even if you make too much or make too little money, because corporations can carry forward losses, it generally makes sense that corporations take their depreciation in years when it's available. It does not generally make sense for a corporation to not take its depreciation. Uh, individuals cannot carry forward losses And because they can't carry forward losses, they should probably only take depreciation or CCA in high income years. It doesn't make much sense to take your CCA that in a lower income year and partnerships, this is sort of a weird thing with partnerships, but partnerships cannot choose. They must take their depreciation or must take CCA in a year when it's available. Okay, so we've gone through our first year here. And after year one, our building now had a uh, ACB of 700,000. That's still true. We've taken $14,000 of CCA. That leaves us with an undepreciated capital cost of 686,000. And now in year two, we would take another 4% depreciation. So we'll take $686,000 times 4%. That's $27,440 of depreciation or capital cost allowance. If you prefer, that would be the year two deduction for this building. So that 27,440 is deductible in year two. And then we'll do one more quick little year here just so that we can finish this out. So now that's uh, that was year two, this would be year three. And in year three that we own this building, it now has at the start of that year, a UCC, it was $686,000. And then we took $27,440 of CCA. We have 658,000. $560 of UCC, undepreciated capital cost. And we're once again going to apply our 4% rate of depreciation, no first year rule here, anything like that. It's not the first year. And there's no last year rule. We don't even know when the last year is going to be. So we're gonna take that times 4%. That gives us $26,342 of CCA, which again would be deductible. And now at the end of year three, we have a, an undepreciated capital cost, the amount of value that hasn't yet been depreciated. It's going to bring us down to uh, $632,218. That's our UCC. And now we're going to sell the whole package. And let's say for the sake of argument, and this would not be uncommon with a land and building package, let's say the whole thing is sold uh, for $2,200,000. And we have an appraiser come in and the appraiser says, okay, the land is worth $1,200,000. 
uh, $400,000 now. And the building is worth $800,000. And there are some rules in place here. Even if you could artificially get the, uh, the building value lower than um, our $632,000, it doesn't necessarily work out in your favor. Land and building packages are really designed from a tax perspective so that you're probably going to pay tax on any gains associated. So there's not really any opportunity for good manipulation available here. You're probably going to see something like what I've described if you're selling this at any kind of profit. So on the land, pretty easy, we have a $400,000 capital gain. That's relatively simple. With the building though, this is a little bit more complicated. With the building, we are selling for more than our ACB. So the ACB is still $700,000, that's easy. 800,000 minus 700,000 gives us a $100,000 capital gain. And just like any capital gain, that's going to have the 50% inclusion rate applied, just like the capital gain on the building or on the land, sorry, up above. So we know both of these things are going to have that 50% inclusion rate. And then we're also selling for more than the UCC, okay, but less than the ACB. So what happens here? We say, well, everything below your UCC is going to be taxable here. So that's 632,218. And that's going to result in a recapture of depreciation, just like we've previously seen. That's $67,722. Oh, sorry, my math is bad there. $762. of recapture and that's fully taxable. Now you might say, well, we should never have taken the recapture in the first place, we just had to pay it back. But actually, you still have the benefit of tax deferral in the year of acquisition, in year two and in year three. And especially if this is a corporation doing this, we're gonna see this later on, the corporation is subject to flat tax rates, it's not subject to marginal tax rates, you don't suffer for having more income in one year for the most part in a corporation. So we, uh, we probably had some good tax planning if the corporation deducted this for those three years. It's still tax deferral and we like tax deferral. It gives us more dollars to use today. And if you only have to repay just straight across your amount of tax deferral, you still end up ahead of the game. Okay, I hope that helps to understand how capital cost allowance, depreciation, and undepreciated capital cost work. That's a fairly fundamental concept. It's going to show up again as we work through these videos. It's going to show up several times. Uh, enjoy your continued studies and hopefully we'll see you back for uh, video number four. Hi and welcome back to the video series covering financial planning for business owners. We're going to now look at the fourth video in the series. We're gonna look at share structures and how this will impact the owners of uh, Trashco. When we incorporate the company, and we're, as mentioned earlier, dealing with uh, for-profit companies now, the original set of shareholders will establish their share classes. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the documentation that goes into that in a couple of videos. Now the words share and stock are often used interchangeably and that's generally okay. Uh, share means just a unit of ownership and then stock is the entire set of shares of the company. Uh, shareholders will have some rights and we're going to look at those rights in this presentation, we're gonna look at voting rights, the rights to dividends and equity rights, and those rights might be defined in the unanimous shareholders agreement, or they might be defined in articles of incorporation or articles of amendment, 
and we'll talk about those things in a again a video with just a couple later in this series. So those three sets of rights, these are really what defines the person's role as a shareholder, or defines the value of holding shares. The first is voting rights. That's the right to appoint the board of directors. And because the board of directors has that responsibility that we talked about earlier around the day-to-day -day operations of the company, this really means that the shareholders ultimately decide on who the folks are who are setting the day-to-day -day direction of the company. And that makes the shareholders ultimately um, responsible, although that's a question of a legal concept, but I would suggest at the very least shareholders who are uh, dissatisfied with board performance can then fire a board of directors. Uh, we have the right to dividends. Uh, shareholders get to share in the after-tax profits of the corporation, and there are two ways these dividends can be paid. You can have variable dividends, and this is what you'll normally see with common shares, that the board of directors looks at the bottom line for the company for that year, says how much can we afford to pay out as dividends versus how much do we have to reinvest back into the corporation, takes that pool of dollars and pays it out to the common shareholders. Uh, fixed dividends, and this is far less typical, when we see prefer, uh, preference shares or preferred shares, then the uh, board of directors is compelled to pay out those dividends every year. Uh, you can't make a decision not to pay those out. Now, if the company does not have any money to pay out those dividends, that's where the board of directors might have to come up with some sort of alternate solution. And preferred shares generally will have uh, characteristics that indicate whether a missed dividend has to be paid in arrears or whether it's just missed and then lost to the board or lost to the shareholders, sorry. And finally, the right that's hardly ever exercised, but it is a right more on paper than anything else, would be equity rights. And this is where we have a corporation that winds up. Well, the common shareholders would have potentially the right to share in whatever equity of the company is left on wind up, although this is exceptionally rare. Uh, the uh, preferred shareholders will typically have a fixed redemption value. This is really more used for retirement planning. We're going to see this uh, way, way down the road in this video series. We're going to see some preferred shares and we're going to see them on the next or in a couple slides here, but we're going to see them actually used as part of a retirement plan way down the road. Now, there are two sort of groups of shares. There's the shares that are actually owned by a set of shareholders, and we would refer to these as issued or issued and paid up shares. It means they'll show up on the balance sheet for the corporation. They're owned by a shareholder, or they can be held in treasury, and uh, that means they're held in the company for uh, later use. The vast majority of shares for a private company like Trashco will typically be held in treasury, a small number of shares will typically be issued. And what that does, it sets the company up with the ownership structure you need, and it gives the company the opportunity then to access those shares in treasury as the company goes through changes and shifts and amalgamations and so forth. Now, what's James gonna do here? So this is, now an opportunity for James to have some useful influence. He knows Connie here and he says, okay, Connie, uh, I know you're looking to set up your company. Um, can we get you together with the right folks? Now, Connie's got a little bit of business background here. Remember, she's got her MBA. So she's aware of some of these concepts very generally, but she recognizes the value of sitting down with the specialist. James puts Connie in touch with a small business accountant. Norman and a corporate lawyer, Melissa, who are going to help them out. And this all facilitates then an introduction between Norman, Melissa, James, Alan, Bruce, and Connie. Uh, and you can see the value here for James, of course, is that now because of his initial relationship with uh, Connie, he's introduced to two other owners and hopefully he can help them to put uh, proper measures in place so that as their business grows, 
that they have uh, good risk management in place, that they have somebody that they can rely on as a sort of independent sounding board. Although we have to be aware here that the fact that James has that initial relationship with Connie, it could constitute a conflict of interest. And that's something that, uh, of course, James and Alan and James and Bruce should be discussing. Now, how is Trashco going to take advantage of this? We're going to see this come up again later on, and this is just an initial look, but what we're going to end up with is Alan, Bruce, and Connie agree that what they each sort of bring to the business represents a 33% ownership stake for each of them, or 33.3333 if you prefer, but you get the idea, a third each, and we're going to um, none of them sorry, wants to have a, a disadvantaged position. None of them wants to be in a, in a minority or a uh, position where they're so far uh, down that scale of ownership that their ownership is really insignificant. I think if any of us were Alan, Bruce, or Connie, we would appreciate this position that you don't want to come into this in a, in a minority position unless there's some uh, good reason for it. And typically the only times you'll see that is where you have a junior to senior type relationship. So if you're bringing somebody in who's your eventual succession plan, maybe that person comes in with 10% ownership and gradually buys their way up to a greater proportion of ownership. The way we're going to do this to get that 33% each is that the corporation, Trash Co., will issue 100 shares to each of the uh, three founders. And these are gonna come out of the class A pool. So we will have 300 shares out of the class A pool. Those shares will be one vote per share, discretionary dividends and no fixed redemption value. This would be very typical for your sort of class A shares. And class A is just a name we apply to these shares. We could call them blue shares or we could call them, I don't know, square shares or whatever, but class A is normal language to use here. And we're going to have then those 300 shares as our only set of issued and paid up shares. Everything else will be held in treasury, including our class B and C shares. Our class B shares are really being um, created in order to accommodate some potential future circumstances. We might use class B shares to create an income splitting outcome although that income splitting is a little bit tough today and maybe Alan and Bruce and Connie don't want to get into this situation of having their spouses as shareholders just yet. Maybe they want to get a little bit comfortable with the business first and see how this looks later on, but we do have these shares available for future use and they can be good for income splitting and I know income splitting is a little bit uh, tough in today's environment, but James advises that yeah, these rules could change. And if the rules change, it's better to have this flexibility built in than it is to have to build that flexibility in later. Uh, we might also have some class C shares. These are often used as part of a uh, succession plan where you're involving some children who may not be active in the business yet, but might be someday. Again, we're not using these today. They're just going to be held in treasury for a potential future use. And we're also going to have some preferred shares, which will also just be sitting in treasury. We're not issuing any of these shares. These will be useful for potential retirement or succession planning. We're not really going to see these preferred shares until deep into this video series. What the intent here is then is to have lots of flexibility without much upfront cost and without having to change things every time we decide we want to adjust anything within the corporation. Uh, this is the role of, I would suggest, the advisors in this case uh, to make sure that the corporation is set up well. So really this should come from uh, James, Norman, and Melissa. They should be helping Alan, Bruce, and Connie to set up their corporation, not just for today, but to accommodate any sort of future changes. I hope that uh, helps. I hope you understand the different share classes. It is a lot of stuff. There's, you know, we get so many different uh, classes of shares here, but set up properly, this is what you're typically going to see in a small business. 
Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you back for the next video in the series. Hi, and welcome back to the video series covering financial planning for business owners. In this video, video number five in the series, we're going to look at the small business corporation and the personal services business. These are, um, I don't want to say necessarily related concepts, but they're good concepts to cover at the same time. Now, why do we care about any of this? Well, we're going to see that there's some tax benefits that accrue from having the proper structure. First, we have to look at uh, CCPC, a Canadian Controlled Private Corporation. This simply means that this corporation is not controlled by non-residents and it's not controlled by a publicly traded company. It's basically two sets of negative definitions that apply here. But CCPC means then it's not controlled by non-residents, which I know is a double negative, but that's how it works in the Income Tax Act, and not controlled by a publicly traded company. So controlled by people who reside in Canada and not any sort of control exercised by a public company. We will talk about control. It's maybe a less obvious concept than it seems when we get to video number six. A small business corporation then is a specific kind of CCPC. And what it means here is that, and this is the language exactly out of the Income Tax Act, assets are used principally in an active business carried on primarily in Canada. And this is very typical language in the Income Tax Act. You see this word principally quite a bit. Principally generally means, although there's some variability here, 50% or more, and primarily uh, generally means 90% or more. And if you uh, follow down that path, you can see that it's actually possible then that less than 50% of the assets overall are used in Canada, but you have to look at principally and primarily together, and you can get all kinds of uh, permutations of this. The point is that it's supposed to be mostly a business operating in Canada. Um, this does apply to the holding companies that own shares of small business corporations. So owning a, another corporation, if that's all that you own, then you basically um, apply the test of that other corporation to determine whether you are a small business corporation. Uh, Trashco, only operating in Canada, presently is a small business corporation. It's a CCPC. Our three owners are all residents of Canada. There's no control by a public company. Um, being a small business corporation gives us some specific benefits here. It gives access to the small business deduction. It's not necessarily that you will be able to use the small business deduction, but you'll at least have the opportunity to use it. That gives you a low tax rate on active income. We'll deal with that in a few videos. And it gives access to the lifetime capital gains exemption. Again, potentially, there's no guarantee you can use it, but you can't use it if your corporation is not a small business corporation. And that would allow the shareholders to dispose of shares and reduce their capital gains tax liability significantly. Um, as of the time of recording this video, it's an $848,252 capital gain that can potentially be exempted. Now, what's a personal services business? Well, it's not a concern for Trashco. Trashco, you'll see in a few minutes, it's fairly obvious that it's not a personal services business, but it is something that we should talk about when we talk about incorporating because sometimes people seek to incorporate uh, for reasons that are not actually going to generate the tax benefits that we might like. So James, our advisor, has another client, Wanda, completely unrelated to Trash Co., just happens to be a client of James's. Um, Wanda is an employee and she's been an employee for a few years in the IT sector working at the same firm. And this is very common in the IT sector. You'll see this in IT, in trucking, and in oil and gas. Those are the three places where the uh, personal services business issue tends to rear its head, although there are other odds and ends, obviously. 
Uh, so Wanda's doing well, she makes a, a good income, it's more than she spends, she's maxed out on RSP TFSA, she'd like to incorporate. She knows if she incorporates, she can retain income in her corporation, really getting a tax deferral that's not otherwise available to her. If she does incorporate, the firm she's working for has said, yeah, Wanda will continue to employ you. They actually like this deal because uh, the firm frees itself up from Canada Pension Plan and EI obligations. They would download those obligations to Wanda and they probably pull her off of the benefits plan as well. So Wanda has some downsides here and those are not often considered adequately, I would suggest, when people are looking at this uh, incorporation decision. Now, does it actually get her any benefit? Well, James says, I think there's something here that uh, we should dig into a little bit more. So he goes back to Norman, the small business accountant that he regularly deals with. He says, Wanda, why don't you give Norman a shout and see how this looks? And uh, Norman talks this over with Wanda. He says, Wanda, you probably have what would be considered a personal services business here, meaning that you're really just trying to use the corporation for its tax benefits. Arguably, you're not actually using the corporation to create any additional business activity. And the problem here is as a personal services business, you lose access to the small business deduction, you lose access, sorry, you're taxed at very high rates, 49% in Nova Scotia on any income retained in the business, and you don't get access to many of the deductions that would be available to a true business corporation. These, are, these rules are designed to, to be punitive. They're designed to prevent people from creating these corporations. It's hard to find scenarios where it actually makes sense to incorporate and create a PSB. Normally what happens in real life is that people incorporate being unaware of the PSB rules and then they get caught later on, um, audited by CRA, and they end up having to deal with a whole bunch of uh, arrears taxation. What's the test here? How do we know if something is a personal services business? Well, this is not always obvious, and there are some uh, variable outcomes in the courts, but in general, there are these tests that we look at. Who owns the tools? Who controls the hours of work? Are you told you have to be there from eight until five? Who carries the risk? Is it the, the contracting entity or the entity who takes on the contract who takes on the risk? Is there any ability to subcontract this out? And do you do other work for other people? And there really is a ton of case law around this. We see personal services business cases come before the courts all the time. Um, as we did here, it is vital that there is a uh, professional advice offered. And it may be that the situation I've described with Wanda, you may find tax professionals out there who say, no, no, she should be fine, that you don't have to worry about the personal services business rules. I'm not saying definitively that they would apply here. But in our scenario, this is what Norman has counseled Wanda to do. It's not a decision that I would be comfortable making with my level of knowledge. I would want this to be passed on to a qualified uh, tax professional, somebody who understands the personal services business rules well. I hope that that makes sense. We looked at uh, CCPC, we looked at small business corporations, and we looked at the personal services business. Uh, please do join us for the next video in the series. Thank you.